Okay, Joey Hinkley, you're upside down. Yeah, I know. Okay, just checking. Just wanted <laughs> you to know in case you were feeling blood rush into your head or something. <laughs> That's intentional. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes you're out in the space shuttle or something and you and you just get disoriented and it's it's you know completely unintentional. Which, by the way, is my aspiration. If they get the if they get the passenger ticket price down below ten thousand dollars, I'm there. Let's see where are we? All right, let's uh let's uh slow roll this uh this kickoff. Um, so how's everybody doing? You guys all we've got about twenty six out of the forty four of you, I think, that are that are here yet. Um, you guys, everybody doing okay? Everybody finding their way back? Uh, I was reading the list of requirements, you guys. I Actually, I didn't get all the way through the list of requirements. I got about a third of the way through your list of requirements, and it, it, got, me, uh, it got me severely depressed. So we are going to ignore COVID for the next two weeks, and then we're going to ignore it, continue to ignore it while, prop, while uh, following all required guidelines. Um, it is a bit cold. I'm down in my basement. Um, it's actually warmer in my basement during the really cold weather because the, the heater only kicks on for upstairs, and uh, and uh, it kicks on a lot more often. The temperature down here tries to be about 60 or so, 55. I think it tends to 55 if I go a little deeper, but it tends to the same temperature year-round. Um, but during the winter time, it actually has the heater on, and I get a little bit of heat down here. Um, so... Actually, yeah, we'll, we'll go on with that later. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Professor Turner, Wes Turner. Um, I've been with RPI uh, about six years now. Uh, and before that, well, actually, I have a long and varied history with RPI. I started here as an undergraduate in 1981, graduated in 85, um, worked for about a decade and got my master's part-time at, at Penn State during that period. Uh, came back in 1993 um, to RPI, and I got my PhD, left for about 16 years, um, and uh, and now I'm back teaching open source software and Arcos and CS1 and operating systems and, and pretty much whatever else uh, they want me to teach. Um, so I have, uh, I'm one of the few people, I think, that can say that they've been at RPI in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s and uh, the 2010s, and now the 2020s. Um, not continuous. It, there's been about, I've been here, I tend to go in spurts of about uh, four to seven years and then, and, then, and then flip out for about a decade or decade and a half. But I've been here for a while. Um, while I was gone after my PhD, I, I stumbled into these open source uh, uh, communities. And in particular, I stumbled into it from a commercial sense. Um, GE uh, actually had a big computer vision uh, group, uh, uh, computer vis visualization. Um, basically, they did a lot of software for the company. And as part of doing their visualization, building scenes, you know, think, uh, think analysis on uh, things like uh, uh, I, I, I helped set up a uh, a virtual environment for running a laser scanning head for inspecting 3D parts, uh, 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 composite parts, rosin. Um, built a big virtual environment to simulate that. Um, we did a lot of things with exploiting uh, medical imaging to detect cancers, to, to measure them out. And all of this was done with open source software. And it was open source software that actually originated at GE. Um, it was billed by a, a man, Bill Lorenzen, and, and, some, and some others as a way to teach um, a course that they were giving. Uh, and so instead of just teaching the course, they taught the course and wrote a book and open sourced the code so that the students could have access to it. You'll see a lot of this code as we go through this course. It's, it's one of the foundational, um, one of my foundational experiences, and perhaps I'm a little more uh, uh, bought into it than, than I necessarily should because I, I you know it's one of the one of the things that I use a lot but it was co code called VTK there's companion called co code called RT ITK that was um, built by GE and a consortium of people including Kitware uh, up in Clifton Park here 
um, under government auspices, again, an open source uh, toolkit for um, that was mainly targeted toward medical imaging exploitation. Um, if you've heard of CMake, that that came out of Kitware by itself. That's you know at Kitware largely their business model is one of the open source business models. Again, um, I worked for GE for about five years. I learned a lot about open source software. I learned that open source software is very viable in a commercial sense. I learned some of the advantages of doing open source versus closed source. Um, and then after that, I actually moved on to Kitware and, and joined them for uh, most of a decade. Um, again, supporting open source. Um, I was actually the director. They hired Kitware to, be, uh, to, to provide services for a company called, for a, a, a community called Osera which was uh, open source health, health, ah, that's my electronic health record uh, agent. Um, so I was uh, the director of open source operations there. That was a project uh, that was, uh, if, you've, if you've heard over the last decade or so about problems in the VA, um, this was a project to try to re revitalize the VA software development by open sourcing some of their code. Uh, and we had a good run of about six or seven years. Um, I left after about five, I think. Um, but uh, I was the director of open source operations there at the time while we were trying to uh, serve as a conduit from code developed by the VA uh, to companies doing electronic health records uh, in the wild, as it were, uh, and provide them with, uh, with the tools they needed to uh, you know, to try to succeed and try to take and adapt the uh, VA's code and, of course, give back. So that's kind of my, my short bio. Um, I don't know. I recognize some faces here, or at least some names. Very few of you have faces, apparently. You're all, um, you all look a lot like white letters on a, on a black background. Um, but uh, that's kind of where we stand. Hi. There's a face. Um, so I am taping this, by the way, just so you know. Uh, I I'm, don't know if we're going to be able to continue taping once we get live, um, but we will do our best to make sure that people uh, know what's going on, uh, mainly because some of my TAs and mentors aren't able to make every course. All right, so where do we start here? Um, let's start with the syllabus. Or actually, let's start not with the syllabus. Let's start even farther back than that. Um, this is an open source course, and it's something of an experiment, but it's an experiment that we've been running for a good number of years, as I'll kind of go over when we, uh, when we go on the, uh, on the record here, when we start with the slides. Um, but the cool thing is that if you go to Arcos, uh, Arcos is the Rensselaer Center for Open Source, and you look for CSCI 4470, there is a public repository. Um, I'm not going to say that it's the best organized public repository in the world. Uh, I, there's a lot of cleanup that we start every year and never quite, skip, quite gets finished. Um, but I will be working on this and trying to make it more understandable as we go along. But if you go there, you can get, you can download your code. And after our second week, you will actually have a lot of experience with Git. So this will be pretty easy for you. But everything we have here um, is, in, is on this website. The major things you want to look at are the modules. Um, lectures and going back a, a step, lectures and labs are old. That's um, deprecated. I'm keeping those around until I find out whether there's anything there that I'm missing. I think at this point I am pretty much good to go, and they will probably be disappearing during this semester. Assignments we'll get into a little bit later. You're going to have to write a uh, a homework, uh, a paper on, on open source communities. Um, you know, so that's where the assignments comes in. There's a there's your uh, your um, projects that we're going to get into. About a third of the way through the semester, we'll start on the projects, um, but we're just going to forget the assignments for the next couple of weeks, and we're going to focus on um, modules and possibly resources. So if you click into modules, these are all the uh, the modules, the teaching material that we have for this semester. Um, today we're in the introduction. The material I'm going to present is on the history of open source, a very short presentation on Linux that I really would like to spend more time with, but um, we're a pretty jam-packed semester, so I, I do kind of uh, not do as good a job on that as I'd like. And then uh, 
the slides I'm going to go over in just a second, which are kind of the syllabus kinds of uh, uh, walkthrough. Next week, we'll do Git. The week after that, we'll do documentation and community. Um, and then we'll get into licensing and build systems and so on. So all of the materials... Hey, I hate to interrupt, but yes. are you supposed to be sharing your screen right now? I... I thought I was, because I'm seeing it in my in my view. Hold on. Let me see what's going on. Oh, if you make a... Huh. Let me check something out. Maybe the stage view. Yep, my apologies. I, I locked the stage view earlier, and somehow it got unlocked. Um, I love WebEx. This is weird. Ah, wonderful. This has apparently broken since the last time I needed to do this. Okay, let's try logging out of this one. I like to run this There we go. I like to run this with my other computer in the background. And that way I can always see what's going on. And apparently, are you guys seeing it now? No luck. No luck. Unbelievable. All right. Um, Looks really good from my end. Well, I think what I can do is this. I will have to explore what's going on. We see it now, it's just half the screen. Yeah, it's supposed to be the whole screen. All right, it's a good thing I went over this ahead of time so that we were all set to go. Well... I'm going to give this one more chance because otherwise I'm not sure exactly what I'm recording. This has always worked well with the OBS software before and it isn't working so well now.
Okay. All right, well, whatever's going on, it's not behaving. So I'm going to have to ask you guys. I'll, I'll share this screen, and we'll see what happens. Um, and I will work on this for next time. But in all honesty, I checked that out ahead of time, and it looked like it was working. Um, all right, so let me go back to sharing everything again. And you guys may have to reconfigure this just a little bit. I think what I'll do is share screen two and then I can just throw things up on the screen two. I love computers. And now I can't get my software to come forward. There we go. All right, so at least now we're seeing the screen, I hope. Give me just a second to uh, resize a few things. But we're going to lose all the cool effects, unfortunately. All right. So, anyway, um, here's our website. Again, this is our uh, the, the site for the class. Um, What we can do is you can come in here, you can download the code um, with you know from Git, and we'll have Git. We'll hit Git in the next um, in the next uh, few weeks. Next week we'll hit Git. Um, this is the assignments directory. Um, you can ignore labs and lectures; they've been largely subsumed into modules. Modules is the layout of um, what we're going to cover. Today is introduction. Um, we use different ways of generating the lectures. Uh, we just because of different um, preferences on people who have taught the course before. Uh, this particular one uses Sphinx and LaTeX to kind of build this up. So as you kind of go through, you'll learn some of these things and you should be able to generate all of the notes. Uh, I will try to post the notes as well. Um, we went into I don't know if we went into resources or not um, but resources are a lot of things like uh, we have some backups of, of, uh, of material that we've gotten rid of just to make sure we don't lose it all um, the important stuff here probably is sample quizzes um, these are all the, the quizzes that have been given in the spring and fall um, I will add not there's 2021 is in there that's the last time I taught the course um, you'll notice there was only one test in 2021 just because of that was the uh, the COVID shortened semester um, but all of the quizzes we give for there's two tests during the year um, here's spring 2019 test one and test two etc um, as I give the tests I don't let you see them I don't put them out here until 
after the semester is over, but once the semester is over, we put them out there. Um, I will provide study guides as we get closer to uh, uh, your different tests. Um, I do have a schedule put together for this year, uh, and it's basically just you know what I said. Um, what we're going to do this year, what we do every year, is on the Monday we will have uh, a lecture. That's what we're doing now. Or Tuesday we'll have a lecture. That's what we're doing now. And then on the Friday we will have a uh, a lab where you'll work through some of the material, and uh, and uh, you know get a chance to kind of practice what I went through when I was actually doing the doing the lecture. Uh, the lectures I like to try to make uh, interactive so you guys can ask questions. I generally am running through. As we get later in the semester, uh, and we're we're doing things like uh, like uh, drop um, like uh, Docker or um, TensorFlow, I'm generally running through examples so that you guys can see as we go through. And then on 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 Friday, that's your chance to do roughly the same thing. Generally, a little bit more complicated, and you have a little bit more time. Um, so that's the general flow of uh, of uh, the semester. Uh, we will have at some point after we get into about the beginning of February, what we'll start doing is we'll start transitioning into you actually working on your projects. Um, we'd like to get past the licensing uh, module first. That kind of tells you what licensing is, why it's important, etc. And once we've done that, then we will have you look at some open source projects that are out there in the world and do an, a written analysis of them. Uh, so that you kind of see how things are organized and, and what you can do when doing your own project and what things you value. Um, that'll be due, you know, the 15th, the middle of February. Um, and after that, we're going to immediately go into project pitches where we'll kind of pit our projects. Um, and, uh, and I've got it arranged so that we stay on a Tuesday, Friday schedule. Um, have our test one more module, and then you guys will go on spring break. Uh, we want, really want you guys to have your projects picked out before spring break because that gives you an opportunity to at least think about them uh, while you're on break, even though I don't expect you to, uh, to do a whole lot uh, during that time. Uh, anyway, we come back, we continue on, we'll have you do a little update presentation telling us you know, what you've actually decided to do, some of the details, some of your preliminary work, um, and then somewhere around the end of... Uh, April or middle of April, what we're going to do is you'll all get to do a, a presentation where you talk about your project, uh, the things you've learned, um, and and give us you know hopefully demos and uh, and uh, report outs on on uh, on what you've done. Um, we'll see how many projects we have. If we have enough time, we could conceivably squeeze out one more uh, module. That's probably not going to be the case because we have to get rid of. Uh, two, well, we have to get rid of, we have to get our number of projects down small enough that we can do them in two days. And quite honestly, I want to let you guys have some time to actually uh, talk about your projects uh, in, in a little bit of detail, not not, exor not exhaustive detail. So, um, but we will kind of work through that. Um, that's kind of the analysis of, of where we are, some of the material you'll, you need to, to know. Um, everything is, like I said, open. It's in this repository. Um, we have a readme that kind of gives you uh, the people who are involved. Uh, we'll go over that in, in a little bit more detail, but if you're ever stuck and you don't know you know, how to get a hold of your TA or myself, um, that material is here. Uh, and then we also have a formal syllabus that will be uploaded to, um, to LMS uh, shortly. So you're all expected to, to at least visit the website and read through the syllabus. And like I said, I will actually put this uh, onto LMS as well. All right. That brings us to the first set of slides. First set of slides, we're largely going to talk about the stuff that's in the syllabus. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to, uh, have to read all of the syllabus to understand this stuff, but anything in the syllabus kind of is the official word, and this is, you know, my talking to you about what's actually in there. Excuse me. By the way, WebEx, just to put this in context, I've had to use WebEx, um, 
I don't know, since the, the spring of 2020, 2020, was it? So almost two years now. And we have never started a semester without WebEx not working the way it worked the previous semester um, and, and to a bad way, you know, as in not being as good as it was the previous semester, although some things have improved. Um, all of the slides here, right, this is an open source repository, so all the slides I give you are of necessity uh, open source. Um, so you'll find out that licensing is a very important part of open source, and if you don't actually have some kind of a tribute, uh, attribution on the licensing, then it probably isn't open source. I'm not going to claim that we have this on everything, um, but I did try to put it on as many things as possible that I present to you. Um, and basically what this says is that you are licensed to use these slides under a Creative Commons license uh, by SA. Um, and what does that mean? Basically, you can take this and you can use it, and you can change it, and you can present it, uh, and you can uh, and you can uh, you know make millions of dollars off it if you can find somebody who will pay you millions of dollars for this course. If you do, and, and you need an associate professor, I will, you know, I will I will join you. Um, but you can do all that so long as you do this. At, you know, give at attribution to the people who have helped design the slides or, or give attribution to, you know, you can't claim the work is yours that isn't yours. You can add to it, claim your own work, but you have to give credit to the people who actually originated it. And that's really all that this, um, thing says, but in saying that it says an awful lot, you know, basically this is a collaborative environment. Um, we try to make these projects better and we try to work together to uh, sorry I'm getting I'm making sure that I can read comments because I just realized they disappeared on me too um, yeah so you know, that's kind of what this course is all about is about that idea of shared data and, any mod and, and Kate points out rightly that any modifications need to be released under the same or similar license. Um, there's a lot of different CC ones. Um, that was what I was kind of st stammering over. I couldn't remember what the SA was. Share alike. Uh, SA stands for share alike. Um, so the, the one other qualification on this is that you have to credit the people who did it, and then you have to make your slides open as well under a share alike license. Uh, and that's kind of a, a GNU or a, a, a free software way of doing things, which is good. There's chat. All right. Now, the other thing I want to do, I like to do, um, this really isn't required by the license, but we, we got a lot of support from Red Hat over about five years. Um, so... Uh, a lot of these slides benefited, this course benefited uh, from that, from that uh, association, and uh, these people were very helpful. I won't go in as much detail on these things later, but I do like to get through it at least once so you guys can kind of see that we're trying to do things the right way. So people, Wesley Turner, I'm the professor, uh, instructor. I'm at Amos Eaton 207. Um, my office hours are going to be Tuesday, 10 to 1130 in person. Um, and then probably Thursday, 10 to 11.30 in my WebEx. Um, that's still under a little bit of uh, possibility of change as I kind of figure out what goes on this semester. You know, are we fully back, et cetera. Um, but this will allow me to, uh, you know, to get to offer both in-person and, uh, and, and uh, web access. Uh, my email, this is not my RPI email. Um, you can also use my RPI email, which is turnu2 at rpi.edu. Um, but I'm more likely to enter to access this one faster because the turnu2 one is on the VPN. And sometimes the VPN crashes and I don't get the emails. We have a P, uh, TA. He's a half-time TA, so only bother him half the time. Uh, Peter Lee. Um, and again, he has a WebEx. We haven't quite determined his office hours yet, um, but we will get that out to you as soon as we can. Um, and, uh, and there's his email. 
we have two mentors this semester so far. I am looking for a third, and, and if, I, if I can pull one up, uh, we will add them to the class. Um, but they are Jeremy Max um, and Yi Chen Li. I believe that Yi Chen is going to, uh, he can't attend our labs or our um, lectures. He's got a, a course conflict. So what I've asked him to do, and I think he's agreed to that, is to um, hold his office hours right after the lab on Friday so that if there are any lingering problems, he can kind of step in uh, and help out uh, right after that so you guys can continue working on the same problem and, and, and kind of get some help on that. Right now, you know, basically this says we're meeting here. We're going to meet here until, I hope, the third week of classes, at which point uh, we will transition to in-person. Uh, my goal is to get in-person as quickly as possible. There's no excuse for having technical difficulties all the time. Um, and, and quite honestly, this setup worked all the time up until, well, I got you guys on. So I'm a little annoyed. Um, we will get it going. Here's an overview of the course. Um, almost every class is going to have some reading material. Um, there's also some just some general reading uh, material in our repository. If we head back here and you go into resources, there's some reading material. Um, I haven't gone over this yet, so I'm not sure exactly how good it is. Now I tend to roll things off every year and, uh, and add new things on. Uh, this Art of Community is something that I added in the last time we taught um, by Jono Bacon. Um, he spoke at uh, um, All Things Open, so did a very good talk on creating and maintaining communities, uh, which is a big part of the actual work that has to be done to, to do uh, open source development. Um, so I added that in there. It's, it's, a, it's a nice little reference. Um, I added this in here, too. Um, so anyway, just you can look through these if you're looking for some interesting material. Um, some nice little references. As far as I know, they all work, although, like I said, I haven't actually been able to go through and pull all of them up yet this semester. On top of that, um, each one of your, your, your reading, your lectures will have some reading or some website that refers you to for documentation. Um, so make sure you read over those, particularly these first couple of, uh, of uh, lectures. You know, this lecture in particular, I'm going to give you an awful lot of reading material, probably about 100 pages. Um, and it's going to cover in more detail some of the concepts that, that you should know going into open source and give you some background. We're not going to use LMS. Instead, we're going to use Submitty. You all should be in Submitty. Um, you know, this link will take you there. I don't necessarily want to follow it, um, but I'll bring it up. Yeah. So you can log into Submitty. You, hopefully you have all seen that so far. There's no gradables here. The main thing we're going to use this for is we'll use this for you guys to be able to submit things uh, submit your slides, join your teams. We'll, we'll maintain all of your teams on here. Um, and then I will try to give you feedback or I will give you feedback via Rainbow Grades. We have some goals. We want you to learn what open source is. We want you to be able and eager to learn new technology stacks. One of the cool things about open source software is that there's nobody telling you, you know, we're going to do this in Python. Well, there are different projects have different requirements. But you can always find a project that's working in the language you want. And if you have a specific project you want to work on, you're going to have to learn whatever technology stack that project uses. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be something you can just get a course on uh, at RPI. So you will have the ability and you will become better at doing uh, new technology stacks. Um, you're going to be able to read and understand good code. Um, if you are using somebody else's code, by necessity, you have to be able to read it. Um, so, you know... That's one of the things that we try to teach you. Um, we want you to be able to patch an existing open source project, submit changes to it. We're going to have you work on a team collaborative project. Um, and 
become aware of and conversant in how teams actually work. One of the cool things about open source is that there's nobody generally, you know, forcing you to work on the open source software. There are companies you can work for that will allow you to work on open source software either in your own time or as part of your duties, depending upon, you know, their dependencies upon the open source software. Um, but maintaining communities where people are free to come and go is a lot different than maintaining communities where you are paid to contribute uh, and your ability to sit, uh, sit down to a nice dinner is dependent upon uh, satisfying uh, the requirements of the project. Uh, it's very easy to alienate people and with open source software, you know, everybody has the right to take their ball and go home or take the community ball uh, and leave, stop working with the community. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then, you know, if any of you are continuing on, um, almost no project is ever done in one semester. Um, not just these projects, projects that are of value tend to go on for years and years. Um, you can get to a good stopping point in a semester, but you can't necessarily get everything done. Um, so this will be, a, you, you know, there's a, the opportunity to pick up your project the following semester in our course. Um, I don't really like this language, but it's the same thing, right? Understand open source tools, understand licensing, understand practical uses of open source, how you go about developing it, testing, version control, et cetera. Um, and then hopefully it, it introduce you to some common open source software stacks and common tools. Um, so um, to build the presentation, um, you, you basically need to, uh, you need to install Python and you need to install some Linux tools and we'll get you installing some Linux tools uh, during lab um, on Friday. Uh, so it basically uses a LaTeX and a, and a, a, a make file that uh, uses Python's Sphinx. Um, so we can talk about that a little, a little bit later. We'll talk about that on Friday, I think. Um, please ask that again at that point. Uh, it's a little bit more not overly complicated once you have all the, the tools installed, but you need to install Make, you need to install Python, I think at least 3.8, maybe 3.9, and you need to install uh, uh, Sphinx and some, some tools for Sphinx. Um, and then if you just go into the, into the build directory, and uh, so once you've downloaded the software, you just go into the build directory for, or into this, the, the, the module directory, like come into here and type make slides or make PDF or you know whatever um, whatever you uh, whatever type of output you want and and uh, and uh, that that's really all there is to it. I would recommend downloading the, your homework for Friday is going to be to do a bunch of reading and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, on Friday we will part of the lab has you setting up uh, some environment stuff getting yourself a Linux distribution, having a Linux distribution or a Linux that you can dip into uh, either via VirtualBox or uh, native or dual boot uh, or even uh, even in some instances like Docker um, will allow you to do all these things. And we'll, we'll kind of work on getting you set up with, a, with an environment uh, at that point. WSL2, I think, can do it as well. All right. And, and again, that'll be part of lab. There won't be any homework due Friday other than you should do the reading that we're gonna. I'm gonna show you in just a few minutes. All right. Um, so that's what we want to do. Here's the syllabus. First three weeks or so. Well, not exactly. Today, tomorrow, or next week, and then we'll get into licensing and the rest of these. Uh, but it's roughly uh, different topics that we're going to cover, not necessarily in in chronological order. Um, we're gonna go over a some different uh, development tools and paradigms. Um, I did a lot with scientific computing and, and statistical computing and, and such. So they kind of form part of some of the, the tools that I want to show you. Uh, and then we'll get into some applications, web, web development, uh, some cloud computing, mobile applications, et cetera. Um, 
last class, last couple of classes, we'll hit maybe, I think right now it's set up to do TensorFlow, and that seems to be pretty popular, so we'll probably stay with that. Um, and then you will also, at this point, be working on your projects. Um, again, class format, Tuesday we'll do lectures and discussion. Friday we'll do labs, programming, development, writing, and discussion. Um, so we'll do all that. Your first lab will be this Friday, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. You know, just, just show up here, and we will uh, get you set up. There aren't that many things that we mark. There's two quizzes. They're worth 10 points. We have you do a paper about a third of the way through the semester on what you've learned about um, uh, open source and, and what makes a good community and what kind of community you would, you would like to work in. Um, that's worth about 10%. There are 11 labs. They're worth 30%. And your project, that adds up. If you add all those up, that comes out to 60%. Uh, and then your project, including your project presentation, counts 40%. Okay, so most of, you know, the balance of your, of your grades are going to be working on a project in an open source environment, uh, hopefully collaborating with your classmates. We're going to have a quiz on the 25th. We'll have a quiz on the 12th. And the one paper that I mentioned is going to be due on the 11th, it looks like. And just a standard grade, uh, grade distribution. Um, it's not all that hard to do really well in the course. You do need to do some work, though. Um, we, like I said, 40% is on your project. And we don't grade you on how well your project works. We grade you on how well you work in developing your project. So you know, if I tell you you need to contribute early, you need to contribute often, you need to have commits, that's exactly what I'm going to look at uh, at the end of the semester. This is a really important thing. Um, we have a Discord. I'm going to paste this into the chat. I want you guys to please, I think I... I think I uh, sent this in the email message, but please join our Discord. Um, we will be using that to uh, do communications. Uh, You know, ask questions there, um, get answers there, um, post updates there, let us know what's going on. Uh, finally, late submissions, 10% penalty, 10% uh, pe uh, penalty if you're late. Once you're late, you have up to a week. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, one day late is worth 10%, up to a week late, 20%. All right? So if you have problems getting your, your, your material in, um, you know, please try to get it in within a week. You'll at least get some credit. Um, we expect you to show up, particularly to labs. I, am, I do want you to show up to these classes as well because uh, what I try to do is I like these to be discussion classes. That's why I really hate doing these online presentations. Um, and at some points, we're probably going to get into, uh, divide up into debate groups and, uh, and uh, discuss different topics, pros and cons and things like that. Uh, so again, regular attendance and participation. Um, I do require formal excuses just because I figure that's um, the health center's job. And quite honestly, I can't go through and figure out uh, if you're really sick or you really have COVID or, you know, what else is going on. Um, if you get an excuse from them, I will generally give you a makeup. Oh, excuse me. Um, and finally, you guys have all seen the integrity policy. Read it over. Um, this, this class is a collaborative class. Um, I don't expect you to collaborate on tests. When you're doing labs, I don't expect you to copy somebody else's lab work and call it your own. Uh, I do expect you to talk to your friends about the lab, to discuss ideas, and to help one another out. That's all fine. Don't claim somebody else's work as your own. That's, that's really... Uh, what we're getting down to. So, um, you know, there's a lot of words around that right here. Um, but what it means is tests are your, don't talk to anybody during tests. Those are completely your own stuff. Outside of tests, in labs, and particularly on your projects, I want you guys working together, but I want you all to take credit for your own code. I don't want you taking credit for somebody else's code. Um, and as long as we kind of follow through there, 
this is not a very onerous policy, despite the fact that it takes up three slides. Uh, so, summary, collaborative environment, talk and discuss, in the end, turn in your own work. Uh, and then for the project, everybody has to have measurable contributions to their project. So you, you know, you personally have to have measurable contributions. Um, they need to be in the open source ecosystem. There are other contributions other than code, design documents, um, uh, collaborate, um, welcome policies, um, guidelines, community policies. Um, there are all sorts of things you can contribute. They all count. Um, code is going to be something that almost everybody wants to do. Um, if you're finding it hard to figure out how to contribute, talk to me early. Don't talk to me um, at the end of the semester. Talk to me uh, once we actually get started. All right, any questions on this? If not, if not, let's get started. Uh, and, and you guys can feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, but let's get started on, on the next part of this. I want to go a little bit over the licensing or over the history. So again, you know, we're going to have the same boilerplate on most of these. Um, I told you that there's going to be reading material. Um, this is a really interesting book by Eric Raymond. This actually is part of an essay from him. Uh, sections one, two, three, and four. I actually read all of those up through nine uh, today, last night. Um, it's it's a, it's a good read, and I've read it a couple of times. But what he's discussing is what makes open source um, communities work, um, and and the things, the the leaps of faith you have to do, and you know how you go go from being a, you know a single project uh, with one person on up through a, a larger growing project and what you can expect from a successful uh, open source project. He's very optimistic. Um, it's not quite as easy as what he says, um, but it's really a good characterization of an ideal, you know, how you have to open up and how you have to work with people in order to get things going. And quite honestly, um, one of the things that he says in there is that it's much more important, uh, it's much more vital for the community that you understand how to do communities than you than you personally be uh, a whiz at programming at least if you're running a project so that's that's um, pretty good um, free culture excuse me this is some of the thoughts that underlie for example the free software movement um, it's talks about IP and it talks about uh, society's conception of IP and how it changes with technology um, I find it a little bit dry, uh, but it, it's it's a reasonable thing to go through and, and look at it from the standpoint of, you know, if you're looking at software, you know, software is, is, is available under copyright, which means that whoever authors the software has the right to determine who gets to use it. And that's a very powerful thing, and it's something that's been used, you know, for centuries in poetry and, um, you know, literature and, uh, and mathematical papers. And some of the questions that come up are: Has as as uh, you know, is software the same as a poem? And um, what happens if you kind of break down that uh, intellectual property argument? Um, and it gives some predecessors for things like uh, like how music copyright has evolved, etc. So it's it's kind of dry, but it's reasonable to read and it's kind of useful. Um, a brief history of regex in your lab. On Friday, we're going to have a, a, a little. Um, one of the originators of this course was uh, was a Krishnamurthy, um, Mukai Krishnamurthy, a good friend of mine. He was a puzzle guy. Regex has been in open source software since the beginning. It's one of the first. It, it was part of uh, the the uh, AI movement, uh, where we were trying to get uh, artificial intelligence semantically. Um, so. There are regex puzzles uh, as part of your first lab, and you'll be expected to work through at least some number of those. Uh, this is kind of a justification for having that little module in there. Uh, so read that through. It's just a page. It won't, it won't take you too much. All right. Um, so any questions on that? I have one more set of readings that we'll talk about in the, in the very last section. We talk about Linux, assuming we get that far. This is this will only take you 
an hour or so to get through all of this material. Um, unless you want to read all of the Cathedral and Bazaar, um, that's actually a nicely published book. Um, I read it a few years ago. It's, it's actually really nice. Um, this is just some excerpts from it. All right, so the questions we want to ask ourselves are, you know, why open source uh, or, or maybe why not open source? Um, and you'll see two different terms used, um, open source and free software. Um, this is like the OSI terms. This is the free uh, Libra software or free software groups, uh, free software foundation. Um, and there's some interesting questions about how they're the same or how they're different. I should probably put this in the reading section because you guys should, should actually go through and read this. Um, this answer right here is a very long, very good answer. It has the four, the four software freedoms that underlie free software, and I think it also has um, somewhere down here. Yeah. It doesn't look like it has the 10 freedoms uh, the, the 10 foundations of, of open source. Um, all right, here we go. All right, here's the free software definition. Um, or here's the free software definition. And then um, here is the open source definition. So those are good to know. And you should particularly know them for tests, at least be able to, to look at them and, and see, you know, recognize them and know what they mean. Um, but basically, this is a very long writing, very interesting, that says that from a practical standpoint, open source and free source are essentially <coughs> the same, refer to the same product. There are very few things that are open that are not also free. Um, and free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. Um, keep that in mind. Um, things like TiVo, uh, TiVoization. TiVo was a big uh, driver of, of some things that were open but not free in the fact that TiVo was designed only to run the source. It was running open source software, but it was designed to only run the open source software that they created. And the hardware would actively reject uh, software that, that wasn't proper properly signed, the whole DRM thing. Um, <clears throat> open source is, a, is our free, free software is more of a philosophy. It's the philosophy that um, it is evil to not share source, essentially, um, that the, the path of righteousness and the, and the path of good is to make all software free. And because of that, some of the most widely known and widely used free software licenses our, our copy left or, or viral licenses. We'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about licensing. Um, but what it does is it imposes, just like um, our, our uh, license for our presentation, right, our Creative Commons license, it imposes a reciprocal requirement on people who use the source. So if you use a, a GPL piece of code, you have to also release your code GPL you know, if you distribute it. Uh, open source is much less, uh, is more about, um, is more of a libertarian maybe view um, that everybody has the right to do with their source, with, with their code, what they want to do with their code. Um, and I choose to make my code freely available because it's the best thing to do uh, for me and the world. So, you know, in, in practical terms, open source and free, free source uh, have a very large overlap. The Venn diagram is almost them sitting on top of each other. Um, but there are some slivers of things that, that can sneak in under open source that don't quite make it under free, under, under free software. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is a really good uh, lead into that, and it's good for you to actually read through it. Um, why would you want to participate in open source? Well, a lot of people participate in open source. A lot of people participate in uh, Arcos, just for fun. They form communities, you become part of a community, you become embedded in the community, and then you want to contribute to the community. Um, and, you know, maybe along the way you want to learn something. There are, however, profitable and successful business models. Red Hat 
uh, Cygnus, which was bought by Red Hat, and Red Hat, which was bought by IBM. Um, Red Hat was sold for 40, four, Red Hat was bought for $4 billion. So somebody paid $4 billion to buy a company that sold free software, um, software that you could get off the web, the web without any cost you know, free in both terms, free as in gratis and free as in, uh, as in uh, freely available. Uh, Kitware has a business model. They do government contracts to get funding to develop open source solutions and then use those open source solutions to create other products uh, under contract. Um, but most of what they do is open source um, and uh, they are the, the proprietors or the, the, the managers of uh, multiple open source, fr fairly well distributed uh, open source toolkits. Um, another kind of business model is a service-oriented business model. So Red Hat and Cygnus both basically sold consulting on top of free software. You know, buy our software and we will help you. We will make it easier for you to install. We will give you a phone number to call up when you have problems. You know, we will make it easier for you to use. Service-oriented, you know, we have this big free software. Um, we will help you. We will help you with it. Um, help you develop with it, uh, develop your own products under it. Um, you can do this for a lot of reasons. You know, altruism is a, is a big one. Engineering and open science, you know, getting access. I don't know, you guys are, are undergrads, so I'm not sure how many of you have, have had to go through and read a paper and try to re-implement it yet. Um, but particularly in, in the computational sciences, you will have to do this. And if you have to implement an algorithm, a complex algorithm, or get complex data uh, based off of a paper, it's really hard to do all but the most uh, trivial things in a reasonable amount of time. So if you're into science, if you, if you want the advancement of knowledge, um, working in open source, providing your code in open source is, is that stepping stone that allows people to build on your work uh, much more quickly and it's much more fun to work with other people. Um, it's just overall a more efficient and more enjoyable experience than being holed up in your lab trying to replicate somebody else's experiment from five years ago in a language you don't know uh, using all sorts of programming tricks uh, that were obvious to the guy who wrote it but not necessarily to you as a first comer to this, to this specific field. Um, Intellectual freedom is a big thing. Um, the whole concept here, idea is a property. That's one of the things you're going to you're going to kind of explore in, in that in that one in that reading on uh, on uh, free culture. Um, you know, if I have an idea and I share it with you, right? I still have the idea. You haven't stolen the knowledge from me. Now you may have stolen a way for me to make money off of it, but. You haven't stolen the knowledge from me. So I'm no poorer having given you the knowledge uh, than I would be uh, otherwise, so long as I have a decent, uh, so long as I'm not depending on this for my daily bread or I have a decent marketing strategy that will allow me to continue to exploit it. Um, you know, again, open medicine, data, ke chemical compounds, effectiveness of treatment, the more we share, the faster we can move these things out. Um, Here's a big one. A lot of, you know, if you've, if you've done uh, Scrum methodologies, if you've done uh, Agile methodologies, a lot of these have come out of uh, the needs of the open source world where people, you know, volunteers are working together to generate something big. Um, and you need a way to kind of make that work. Excuse me. You have to you have to find a way to make that work. Um, while pulling in contributions and allowing people to be effective. Um, so this whole scalable software development has resulted in, in Git. It's, you know, repositories that are very good at merging and managing multiple branches. It's resulted in models where um, you know, you have multiple people working on very small issues with constant feedback from a user community, which kind of characterizes uh, s some of the ideal communities that Eric Raymond talks about in, uh, in the cathedral and the bazaar. Um, so, you know, if you've, if you've worked on these different things, um, the NIH in England, uh, the National Institutes of Health, or 
uh, NHS, National Health System, in England tried to rewrite their, um, their software to run the National Health System. The software had grown up organically, um, and they tried to replace it by, by generating essentially a cathedral, understanding all the requirements and pulling it together this incredibly complicated um, system uh, to, to, to manage the national health system. And it failed spectacularly uh, in, in the terms of billions of dollars. Um, I said that I worked for OSERA, the Open Source Electronic Health Record Agent. Um, that all came out of the VA was trying to uh, revitalize, trying to redo all of their uh, internal EHR systems. And they were, again, failing miserably. Um, this, the system, the VISTA, the system that we were supporting, uh, had developed, again, organically using open source, you know, largely in an open source environment uh, over uh, 40 years. Um, and it evolved this level of complexity that was just really hard to, uh, to, uh, to replicate, um, you know, saying in two years we're going to build this really huge system. So there are some really good things about open source development uh, in terms of how you achieve uh, high quality, big projects, um, you know, even in an industry. So um, scalable software development is, is kind of big in my book on that. Um, on the other hand, why wouldn't you want to do open source? Well, there are intellectual property concerns. Once you've given away the idea, you no longer have uh, sole rights to it. So, you know, you have to kind of figure out, you know, if you're, if you're Coke and your whole business plan is we have a secret formula and we're going to lock it up and no one's ever going to get to it, well, you don't want to share that, right? That's not something that can be open sourced. Uh, if, however, you are, you know, uh, you're building Linux and you don't have the manpower to write this extremely complicated kernel all by yourself uh, over a period of, uh, you know, 80 years now or something like that, um, 60 years. Um, I guess Linux actually started in, I think, in the 80s, but early 90s. I don't know. It's in, it's in the documents. I read it last night. I'm just blanking on it. Um, Anyway, um, you know, if you, once you give it away, it's not yours. So if you're going to make money off it, you need a different plan for making money. If you don't care about money, then this is probably not an issue. Um, it is a little bit chaotic. It's all volunteer-based. It's distributed. And while there's generally one or a few people at the top who make the decisions about what gets in or what doesn't get in, uh, in truth, if it's really open source, there's really no clear authority because you could go into Linux now as a person, as an individual, you could fork it, and as long as you abided by the open source license, I believe it's under GPL, is it under two or three? Anyway, as long as you abided by the terms of the licensing there, you could do a completely new fork, completely divorced from anything Lin uh, Linus Torvalds does and anything the Linux community, uh, the current Linux community does, right? So, you know, if by authority you mean somebody who has the right to tell you what to do, well, there is no authority because you can always take your toys and go home into your own sandbox and still continue working on it and still continue distributing it. Um, it's hard to change code sometimes. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that uh, since everybody can see the API, right, even those hidden APIs, when you have when you have proprietary code, you tell people how they use your code, but you don't necessarily um, let them see all the ways you use the code. And it's those little hidden internal APIs. All of those can be seen in open source software. And when you change those, and you give the next update to somebody, and they've been relying on this hidden API to do something spectacular on their own, and you've removed it or changed it, you've now broken their entire code. So backwards compatibility is extremely important in an open source project. Um, you break it periodically. You know, almost every project has to break uh, the public API eventually. Um, but until you do, and, and, you know, break it advisedly. Don't just break it every day. Make sure you document it. Make sure you give people outs. Make sure people know ahead of time. Um, because quite honestly, um, you know, I'd be in situations when I was working where we had, uh, for, for Kitware where we had developed software for somebody five years ago, and we made a breaking change to the API, and now they've come back for additional work, 
and it's pretty hard to tell a company that, well, you know, we, we built this for you uh, for X number of dollars two years ago, and just before we can even add anything into um, the software, we have to get it now working again because all of our tools have marched on, right? That's a pretty hard sell. Um, so, you know, because you can see these things, because you can see the internal structure, um, you have to acknowledge the fact or you have to be, uh, you have to be uh, aware of the fact that people can use this. And if people are using this, then, you know, you have to, uh, you have to be careful when you change it. Um, breaking changes are painful. When you start working on a project for this class, um, when you start working on a project for Arcos, I can guarantee that you won't get all of the benefits of open source software. You won't be getting uh, people from around the world telling you you have a bug. You won't be getting free free uh, free energy from uh, you know from Google Summer of Code. Um, lots of stuff won't. Lots of the benefits that the Linux kernel gets will not be available to you. Um, in order to get to that point, your community has to grow to, to a certain size. Now, if you look at some of the projects we have, uh, in particular, if you look at Submitty, Submitty has kind of reached that point. Um, they are actually getting, they get students working on Google Summer of Code almost every summer. Uh, they get co uh, contributions from, uh, from other universities who have managed to install the code. Um, you know, they've reached a size where their community is big enough that they start to get some of the benefits back uh, from, from open source development. But it doesn't come, you know, on a two-person project. It has to be, you know, dozens of people uh, and, and, uh, and, and users. Um, you know, if you own the code, if you sell the code, or you lease the code, right, with all the oilers, um, you understand how to make money off that. If you're giving away the code, you don't understand necessarily as well how to do it. And if you look at, uh, at one of the... Uh, well, I'll, I'll show you a couple more readings when we get to the next set of slides. Um, but they actually talk about some of the business models uh, that are available and that are, have been successful uh, under open source software. So, you know, one of the reasons not to go open source is you have a proprietary business model. Um, oh, was that all we had? Yeah. All right. Um, so it's really clear how to sell, you know, how to sell the, the latest, uh, the latest uh, um, World of Warcraft or, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the latest game du jour is. All right. Uh, any, any questions? 1991. Thank you. So Linux started in 1991. That was, um, it started out pretty small, uh, although Linus did have, uh, some working software at the time. He was just encouraging other people to join in. Any questions about this part of it? All right. Um, in the cathedral and the ba bazaar, we talk about two different worlds. Uh, and in the cathedral model, and, and I, I'm going to say that this is um, not quite the same cathedral that it used to be, um, there was development by a single person or by a chosen committee. Right? And the idea was that this group would encapsulate would encapsulate all of the requirements of the, of the, the software. They would largely write the software. They would largely test the software. And when they had something that was solid and ready to use, they would throw out a beta and begin... Uh, presenting it to users who would largely expect a nearly finished, um, a ne nearly finished work of art, as it were. Uh, and the concern was that if you didn't give something that was, um, that was very solid, easy, you know, usable, didn't have a lot of bugs, that they would try the software once, throw it away, and never try it again. Okay? Um, in order to do this, you needed to understand all the complexity of the software, and you needed to be able to... Uh, basically, you know, within a single group, do all of the work necessary to get there. So all of the funding, all of the money had to come from essentially you. Um, the bizarre model, right, you think of this as a, uh, as a flea market uh, or an uh, open source market. Um, the idea here is don't start out by building the cathedral. 
put up a couple of stands. Get something that people can use that's functional and that actually does something. And then immediately open it up. Release early and release often. And don't worry about minor bugs. If you get minor bugs but you fix them almost immediately, um, then what you're going to do is you're going to build up goodwill among your user community because they know as they find things that are wrong um, that you will make it right and they will be able to continue their work. Right? So the whole idea is this is a much more chaotic thing. You have to really listen to the people you're distributing it to. You have to be have very fast cycle times and you need to, uh, you know, you have to kind of be willing to make your users um, part of your, your development team. And as you get into commercial software now, right, we're no longer building cathedrals. We're trying to mimic this model inside companies by having uh, agile, you know, agile design um, and stand-up meetings and all sorts of, uh, of, of different uh, mechanisms to try to mimic um, this bizarre model uh, that, that kind of occurs naturally in certain types of open source projects. One good way to get involved is start by doing something you're interested in. Uh, a lot of you will probably do games. I would change this now. I think I probably should have gone through this slide. Um, we see a lot of people doing things on uh, web development. Uh, some of it is games. Some of it tends to be on things unique to uh, the RPI community, unique to the RPI campus. Uh, shuttle Tracker, uh, Yaks, you know, students have problems signing up for classes. Quacks. When Yaks had a couple of a uh, couple of years of uh, sketchy uh, uh, launches, um, you know, so all of these tend to be things that are interest or of are critical to your experience, uh, and they form good things, good uh, projects because one, you know about them, you know about the sticking points, uh, and also you have a built-in uh, user community, uh, including yourself. Um, these are, by the way, these are different uh, quotes from from within. The Cathedral and the Bar essay. Uh, good programmers know what to write. Great ones know what to write, rewrite and reuse. Um, basically, what this says is don't fall prey to the not written here or not invented here syndrome. Um, you know, if somebody wrote a really great uh, module, a piece of code that you can use, and you decide to rewrite it yourself, um, you know why? Uh, there's always something else, always some other place your code, your, your uh, energy can go, uh, that, would, that would make the project better, and all you have to do is give credit to somebody else. Uh, and that's kind of the, the whole theme of, of uh, open source development. Um, I like this one, plan to throw one away, you will anyhow. Um, most of the time when you develop software, uh, your first, even your first successful product is not necessarily as good as you would like, not as cleanly written. Um, the act of writing is an act of discovering. So the act of writing the code actually helps you discover what the code should do. Um, that's part of why this cathedral model has so many flaws. Um, because as you're writing the code, you're learning a lot about what the code, about how the code should be written and how the code should work. Um, if at the end you have this big cathedral, it's really hard to tear that down and build it up again. So, you know, if you're doing this more incremental development, it's much easier to throw away your earlier um, your earlier successes that weren't quite as good as they could have been. Um, your interests are your interests. Find a problem that's interesting. And if you have the right attitude, you keep your eyes open, you're looking for some place where you can contribute, eventually uh, you'll find an interesting problem come your way. Release early, release often. This is probably the hardest thing that I that I try to get through to this class. Um, you know, don't release garbage, but release as early as you can in a way that you can keep things. Uh, you know, that that people that has to run. People have to be able to see what it is you're trying to do. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles. It doesn't have to do anything. It does have to do something. Um, and then once you've started that initial release, you know, follow it. Keep working on it. Be responsive to, 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 uh, to people's needs. Uh, and if you do that, you can build up a lot of goodwill, even if you have a lot of initial bugs. 
Um, and that kind of goes right hand in hand with, uh, with that next bullet as well. Um, this one I like. We have this, you know, we are in a situation where, excuse me, every four years we lose an entire group of students, right? Every, well, every year we lose one-fourth of the students who are interested in anything. Um, so we see in our coast a lot of things that come to uh, this, this kind of fork. The original developers are gone. Um, can we now, at this point, continue development by handing it off to somebody competent? Um, and you know, as the person running a project, knowing when and how to hand it off and, and finding somebody competent to, to, to take over uh, can, can be the difference between a project that runs uh, three years and done or a project that runs uh, 12. This doesn't say what you think it says, probably. Um, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix will be obvious to someone. This is a better way than, than, than some have phrased it. Um, this is the uh, many eyes make easy bugs, make for easy bugs. What this says is that if you got a lot of people, you're going to find a lot of bugs. And if you find a lot of bugs and you have a lot of people working on those bugs, these people working on the bugs are going to have different viewpoints, different, and, and these, by the way, can be the same people. Um, they don't have to be, though. With this much diversity, you're going to find more bugs, and you're going to have people that have different outlooks and different ways of doing things that are going to be able to take bugs that, may, you know, maybe a specific bug is hard for me, but you understand it, or it's something you've worked on before, it's something you've seen before, and you can fix it quickly. So it says that if you have enough people using your code and enough people who are skilled in developing your code, then it's easier to get rid of bugs than if you don't. Um, and that, again, comes back to this, to this cathedral thing, right? Cathedral, a lot of problems with software that comes out of industry um, is that the people who tested it are the same people who wrote it, or at least the same company. They have the same expectations. They're working from the same spec, they work. They they uh, test it in in a, in a way that meets that it meets their expectations. Well, these people may not have anywhere near that same expectation if you have enough of them, uh, and that allows you to get rid of bugs um, much more quickly. And by the way, there's I, I should dig up these statistics, but there have been studies that have shown that finding a lot of bugs during development. Um, does not mean that the code that's released is of low quality. Um, finding a lot of bugs generally means that you've got rid of, gotten rid of uh, more of a higher percentage of the bugs than projects that don't find a lot of bugs. So, you know, finding bugs early is really useful and important. Um, okay, wow, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, smart data structures and dumb code works a lot better than the other way around. Um, the concept here is just you're writing code that you're going to share. And if you write really intricate, smart code that's hard to decipher, it's going to be harder for other people in practice to use your code uh, to either fix your bugs or to, uh, or to improve upon it or to even incorporate it into, into a new uh, usage. So if you do something smart with your data structures such that your code can be absolutely trivial, um, that's really easy for other people to see and to... Um, fix and uh, understand. Um, really intricate, cool code is hard to understand, and that makes it not as good in an open source environment. Um, and you know, treat people well. You're do you're doing a community. Beta testers are willing to test your buggy product um, for whatever reason. Um, so treat them like you appreciate the fact that they're using your buggy software for whatever reason. Um, and they will become pretty valuable because they will help you uh, expand faster with higher quality code. This one is kind of like, a, what is that, Mencala? Um, really simple game with really complex strategies. If you have a really good tool, you should be able to use it in ways you don't expect. Um, and 
the near Turing complete here is not really as useful as this is the exact quote from the cathedral in the bazaar. What this is basically saying is syntactic sugar is stuff that just makes code more understandable or um, yeah, more easy, easier to understand. Uh, so this basically says if your code is easier to under, easier to understand, that's good. Um, this near Turing complete is just a specific example he had uh, where he had a very limited language. This can the syntactic sugar for complex languages can become overly complex and result in too many pages of specifications and hard hard uh, to parse code. So you know so if, if you get too complicated, um, simplify. Um, but if you put in things that make your language easier to read or easier to understand, easier for a person to parse, that can help with the understanding part of the open source. All right, software management functions. If you're going to run a project, you need to define the goals and keep everyone pointed in the same direction, right? If you have 50 people and 49 of them are working in one direction and the other one's busy undoing all that the 49 are, do 49 are working on, uh, that's not going to work as well. You want everybody with eyes on the prize. You need to kind of keep track of, you know, it's really easy, particularly in these chaotic environments, for things to get stick to get skipped, um, particularly those small critical details that everybody else figures that everybody figures somebody else is working on. So if you're managing it, you need to keep track of that. Um, everybody likes certain things. A lot of people in our business like writing code. They don't necessarily like testing code. They don't necessarily like documenting code. Um, right? You need to make sure that all of that stuff is getting done uh, so that the code re remains maintainable and understandable by uh, multiple people. Um, and sometimes you can throw a little bit of organization there, you know, the person who is an ex uh, expert on databases, maybe you can get them to work on the database portion. Uh, the person who's an expert on U user interfaces, maybe you can get them to work on the user interfaces. Um, you know, make sure that, that people are working on things that they both find are rewarding and that make their, uh, that lead to an improved product. And finally, right, if you need more people, right, if you're, if you're, if your research, if your scarcity is people, you need to get more people. If your scarcity is machines, you need to get more machines. If your scarcity is hardware or something else, you know, some specific software, you need to get more software. If it's money, you need to get more money. If you're going to be a software manager, you know, that's kind of the last thing. Resources aren't necessarily money. Um, they're not necessarily, you know, they, they could be time. They could be people. They could be uh, users. Um, as a manager, you have to figure that out and kind of get them pointed in the right direction. You all are going to establish or join an open source project. So here's some pointers along the way. Um, and we'll come. you can come back to this. I'm going to recommend you circle back to this uh, when we're going to be generating our project proposal portion. Um, you need to have a clear vision, right? Just something short, concise, that says what it is your project is going to do. Um, and if you know, well, at some point you should know, uh, what tools, what software stack you're going to use. Um, try not to get in the, the habit of throwing everything at a particular project, right? You don't want to have, you know, 30 different languages and, uh, and uh, you know, multitudes of different build systems, etc. Pick something simple that you can understand and that can be implemented. You want to get team-oriented people. You want people who are all in it for the same reason. Right? You don't want two people in there in particular who have conflicting views and who are unable to compromise. Um, that's a pretty easy way to you know, re result in an early fork or a broken project. At some point, you're going to have to have a leadership structure. One, peop one person, you don't need it. Two people, you probably don't need it. Five people, you're probably going to want to start thinking about how you come up with breaking conflicts. How do you decide among competing priorities? How are you going to decide what code makes it in and what code isn't good enough? You know, how, how do you decide what direction you're going to go in? You should have some idea of your management structure. 
benign dictator is is one of the is one of the uh, the structures that's often used in, in open source. Uh, that's just assuming that there's one person that makes the decision, and they generally are listen to everybody and make a reasonable decision. But you can also have consensus. Um, you can also have vote. Um, you can also have vote based on meritocracy. People who have contributed the most uh, get the mo get the loudest voice. Establish an effective software process. Um, you know, before you have 100, 100 people contributing to your code, you want to know what requirements do you have for style? You know, what requirements do you have for testing? Uh, what requirements do you have for documentation? Do you have a standard way of doing your APIs? Um, do you have a standard naming convention? All of those things and the process for how you're going to bring code in, you know, do you do a pull request? Re how many reviews do you need? All of that should be defined before you get to the point of having 100 contributors. Um, you know, at two, at one or two contributors, it's probably not um, not required. But as you start building to four or five or ten, you know, somewhere along that line, you're going to want to start defining these things uh, so that you can avoid pain and and avoid uh, conflicts. Um, and then, how are you going to talk? We're going to use in this class. We'll use Discord. We'll use Submitty for um, some things. We'll use emails for one-on-one -on -one or small, uh, you know, one to a few kinds of communications. Uh, Discord will be our major way of chatting. Um, you know, you can also have mailing lists. Periodic, we'll have periodic face-to-face -face meetings too, hopefully twice a week. Um, decide those things as well. And again, some of these can can change or be refined or come into being, you know, after you're past your initial few. Uh, months of, of a project or, or your initial uh, few handful of developers. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what else you can say here. You can't really start a project without some core. Um, if you want people to contribute, you need to have something for them to hang their contributions on. So even if it's just a scaffolding or, um, you know, uh, you know, something that they can use to build into and test their code and make sure it works. You need to have some kind of core uh, available early. And if you're going to do that, then you probably want to start out without 100 people, right? Start with a few key people to kind of build up and generate this uh, core. Nobody likes to test. The earlier you test, the more ingrained it becomes in the project the easier it is when you now are taking submissions from 100 people and you have to figure out whether uh, the 101st contribution breaks the previous 100 contributions. So start testing early. Um, write tests so people can see what your code does, so people can use that information to, uh, to validate their code and make sure that their code works as well. Uh, and then you know lock up the language. Figure out how you're going to write it. Don't let that be an open-ended free thing, uh, free for all, um, and don't rewrite. Right? This is this goes back to uh, uh, know what to reuse instead of rewrite. Use existing open source tools and libraries. Uh, don't feel that if you didn't write everything that it's not yours. Um, you are providing your code as a benefit uh, to other people. You should be willing to take their contributions as well. Um, all right, and finally. We're going to talk about this in, in more detail during the licensing discussion in a couple of weeks. Um, but licensing is extraordinarily important in open source software for a number of reasons, not, not, uh, not least of which is to keep somebody else from stealing your code uh, and making it proprietary and claiming it as their own and then stopping you from using it. And licenses have different impacts on what other software you can use. And also, if you're thinking about making money off it, how you can go about making money. So we will talk about all those, but but these are the steps you want to go through when you're kind of getting started. Uh, and we'll, we'll, you'll, you'll be doing this in, in about four weeks or so. Uh, any questions? Any discussion? You guys can unmute if you want. I'm happy to take, uh, to take typed or verbal questions. Pretty long for a first day, huh? All right, one final thing. This is a little bit shorter. Um, I am going to kind of push this one off on you guys just a little bit. 
Um, this is a really brief history of open source. This will take you about 10 minutes to read. Right? And I didn't do that right. Right? This is... I don't know. A lot of blank pages. But... Six, seven, eight... I think it's about 20 pages, but it's a real light read. Um, and what it's going to talk about is it's going to talk about um, the, de the development of this, this module here is, is on Linux. So it's going to talk about the development of free Unix variants. Uh, there's really two major flavors of this. One is the Linux, uh, GNU Linux branch uh, that arose out of uh, the GNU um the GNU software tools and Linus Torvalds um, cur uh, Linux kernel um, uh, the, uh, changes to the Minix kernel. Um, so that's going to be one group. The other group came out of Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley was working with uh, Unix developer AT and T, uh, and they were extending AT and T, and AT and T had a proprietary core, um, and BSD kept improving on the tools around that core until the point where uh, AT&T stopped giving the code out largely for nothing. Um, it had a, a $50,000 licensing fee, but if you were a research organization or a university, you could get it for nothing. Um, BSD decided that they, they finally wanted to, uh, to kind of break away from that, and they had a couple of different ways, a couple of different projects that went through and developed a BSD variant uh, to the to the uh, um, Unix kernel owned by AT and T. Uh, they did some some uh, black box work. You characterize, write a specification for um, what you need, and then you have somebody else go out and write it uh, without looking at the original code. Um, so you know there there are two basic free Unix derivative. Uh, trees. One is B the BSD tree and one is the Linux tree. And this one does a really good job of kind of talking about that and some of the philosophical underpinnings. This paper is not for the faint of heart. It is a very long paper. I think it's 44 pages, but it reads much longer than that. Um, about uh, the European community did an analysis of free open source software, um, and they did a, a pretty thorough analysis. They have a really pretty thorough history. Um, and they follow that up with an analysis of uh, uh, market opportunities, uh, cost reduction opportunities for existing businesses, uh, and a number of different uh, concepts that are pretty um, useful to know in the open source world. So read this one first, then read this one over the period of a couple of days uh, in small bits um, so you don't get overwhelmed. They do cover some of the same material um, this one covers it, I think, a little bit more thoroughly than, than this one. All right? So this one is, is I think, it, like I said, I think it's 44 pages, but it's, it reads much longer than 44 pages. So here we go. East Coast, MIT launched the GNU project, right? He got mad. Richard Stallman got mad that uh, this laser printer they were using from, from Xerox uh, was no longer supported. And he was unable to get it working on a new system because he didn't have access to the source code. You know, so after thinking about this, he decided that um, it was a good for all source code to be free. And you should always be able to, if I'm using your code, if you've given me your code, if I've paid for your code, however I've acquired it, right, I've, I've paid for the, for the rights to have that knowledge. And so having paid for that or having gotten it free, right, um, I deserve the right to change it and modify it and make it work for me. Um, and that was essentially, this came out of a printer stopping working. Um, UC Berkeley had a long association with AT&T, but AT&T eventually, uh, like all good things, came to an end. Um, definitely by the first... So this says, will all this be on Submitty LMS? This is a this is a reading assignment. There's not a uh, a 
Wait a second. Oh, somehow I... So the question is, when will these readings be completed? These are, um, there's not really a firm due date. Have these, you should, you should know this stuff uh, by the test because part of the test will be based off of this. Um, but there's not, there's not a, there's not a, uh, there's nothing to submit. It's a reading assignment. Like I, you know, I tell you to read chapter three from your textbook. This is the chapter three from the textbook. So this is, you know, this is something that'll be part of the test, uh, mainly part of the first test coming up. You've got a couple of weeks for that. Um, it all deals with this material. Okay, so I would, I would like it to be done by the end of the week. Um, but, you know, if you, if you didn't have it done, that would be, there, there's not going to be a grade on it. Okay, does that make sense? Um, Yeah, and, and so AT and T had a working relationship with with uh, UC Berkeley, and UC Berkeley had, was writing all these tools based off of the Unix kernel uh, that they were calling the uh, the BSD, the Berkeley. Man, I should write these things down when I'm reading it. Um, anyway, um, they they had this BSD code that they were writing on top of the Linux kernel, um, and then AT and T kind of started getting broken up. Um, and as that happened, easy access to the AT&T Unix license became less and less possible even for research, um, research entities. Um, so BSD decided, you know, they had this nice BSD license. It's one of the licenses we'll look at. I think they're, they originally had a, a two-clause license, and now there's a three-clause license. Very liberal. Um, as, well... Um, very, uh, it's, it's not a copy left license. It allows you to do pretty much whatever you want to do with the code, so long as you say who who uh, who gave it to you. Um, but they couldn't give it away because if they gave it away, or couldn't give it away as freely as they wanted, because if they gave it away, um, people had to buy uh, an AT and T license, uh, AT and T Unix license. Um, so they eventually started working away from this kind of, uh, you know, they started nibbling away in, uh, I think, three or four different projects uh, to actually get rid of the uh, AT&T part of Unix. Um, there are, are more, you know, so this is, there's two Linuxes, two, or two, uh, two uh, open Unix distributions, um, Linux, uh, GNU Linux, and, uh, and, uh, and BSD. There's also tech, which is one of the things that we use, we will use to, uh, to kind of build our, you'll get exposed to it during the documentation uh, module, if not before, uh, and it's one of the things we use to build our notes here. We can go over that uh, as well. Um, uh, um, let's see, those exist today. Um, they all started out at about the same time. Donald Knuth was writing a series of books on the art of computer programming, uh, and then he got sidelined by the fact that he didn't like the tools he had to use to write his book, so he wrote uh, Tech, which was released open source, and then that became LaTeX, um, and LaTeX is still uh, one of the major ways of publishing scientific papers uh, today, and I think he still hasn't quite finished up his Art of Computer Programming, but he's got, a, I think, six volumes is what I have. Um, you know, as this development was going on, uh, we were also getting better um, communication strategies. Uh, Usenet groups and communities were forming. Um, they were sharing code on these Usenet communities. So by sharing code, they were able to patch each other's programs and distribute code outside of going to a store and buying it. Or, or, or buying a big hunk of iron from IBM and getting the code installed. Um, and then along came something called X-Windows, uh, which was an open source consortium. Uh, all the companies, a, a number of companies, uh, wanted windowed environments that they could use on their Linux-based machines or uh, Unix-based machines. Um, they got together. 
They founded the X Windows Consortium, um, and that that what became a dominant player in um, you know non Windows uh, machines. Uh, I still run it on my machine today when I need to use a windowing system on well, certainly on on my Linux box, but also even uh, there are there are plugins for uh, Windows as well. Um, okay, so. On the Unix side, the BSD side, Bill Jolitz, who apparently was a hard person to get along with, um, started developing 386 BSD, which was a replacement for the AT&T kernel. Um, but he was hard to get along with. So somewhere along the line, people started branching off. And we got NetBSD, FreeBSD, and OpenBSD as forks uh, of, you know, this original uh, development or, or, you know, subsequent forks of previous forks kind of thing uh, or parallel development. So these guys were not all working together. Um, he was the first to kind of to kind of come up with the uh, with the first kernel that was free of the AT and T copyright, um, but he wasn't the last. And there are now multiple um, BSD kind of open Linux distributions. Stallman had generated GNU, but they were trying to build the kernel in kind of this cathedral model. And it turns out that that's kind of hard to do. Um, Linus Torvalds was playing and having fun with a Minix kernel um, and somehow encouraged the rest of the world to join him and developed. Uh, a Linux kernel using a lot of GNU software as the types of things that that kernel could run. Um, and that has now evolved as well. Uh, Red Hat, we've talked about, you know, Debian, if, you, if you're familiar with Ubuntu, Ubuntu is a derivative of Debian. Um, there's, I don't need, I can't keep track of them. There's Arch Linux, there's Mint. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of Linux distributions, very rich ecosystem. Um, apparently f fairly profitable since there are so many people trying to, uh, to actually operate in that domain. And that was just the start. Apache released a WW server, a world, uh, World Wide Web server, um, Perl, and then, well, Perl was an interpreted language bioinformatics, doing a lot of, uh, uh, of AI types of things, I believe. Uh, R is a statistical language. It's really good at doing statistics and, uh, and uh, matrix algebra kinds of things. Um, you can use it instead of MATLAB if you're uh, willing. Um, and then Mozilla decided to give up their browser, which wasn't necessarily making them a lot of money, but it was necessary to support their browser in order to keep the standards open and keep their servers um, making money. So they released their, w, their their browser that became Firefox eventually, uh, GNOME K KDE desktop environment um, is out there. KDE, by the way, is now built using CMake, which is a product, product from Kitware, uh, one of our local companies. Uh, there's more of them, right? Python, Java, Go, all those are open source programming languages. We're now getting into open data, and uh, a lot of government entities are requiring that if you get public money to do your research, your research must be open as well, both the data and the computations. Um, and that, like I said, is a very quick summary of Linux. Um, there are a lot more in the, uh, the reading material. I'm going to encourage you to read that. It's kind of fun. Um, although, like I said, this can be a, this one taken small doses, um, or at least don't do it at 1 a.m. because I was trying to get through it at 1 a.m. and it was getting to be tough. And I've read it a couple of times. Um, all right. So, any questions? Discussion? Anything? Did I miss any? Did I miss any questions? I think there was one question about what if we can't make those times. Was that for the? Uh, was that for the tests?
I didn't ask that question, but uh, since it was asked, I'm guessing that other tests during class time or yeah. before test block. The test will okay. just be during the during the class block. There's no there's no separate time for them. Okay. Okay. My uh, my other question, I think it was asked before, is um, how do we like build the presentation? Because in the in the repository, it's not like there's a presentation there. There's just um, some yeah. source files. I'll post these slides to the discussion or to the to the course materials on submitting. Um, but you know, basically, to build the presentation, uh, you have to uh, you have to once you install Linux, it's basically just you go into the directory and you type make. Um, so here, let me uh, hold on a second. So yeah, we have we have five minutes. Let me show you, let me show you. Um, I can't do it on this machine because I. Did not get. I forgot that I present on one machine and work on the other. So let me stop sharing this. Let me go back to sharing this. Let's see. Okay, and uh, doing that. Um, apparently, the question about the test stuff was actually about office hours. Um, oh, which is actually a good question because, like, also, um, yeah. at least I can't make any of your office hours. So. Yeah, so Eric, uh, the tests are going to be in person, assuming RPI permits. Um, and uh, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty open on office hours. Either hit me up on Slack, or um, either hit me up on Slack or uh, um, or or you know email one of the TAs or one of the mentors. Uh, we'll try to make time for you. Uh, if you can't do it on on the normal office hours, you know hitting me up is probably a good first. A good first one. I'm happy to meet with you guys. These are just the ones that I'm just going to have standing. Anybody can just drop in on. All right. So, um, yeah. So, so like I said, just feel free to to DM me or uh, and we'll uh, DM me or email me, and we'll find some times. Um, this just allows me to do it. You know, giving you some set times makes it easier for you if you have you know if you if you happen to have questions at those times or you know you can plan. But if you can't make those, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, to uh, to meet with you. Okay, so um, if you're familiar with Linux, this is actually OS X, uh, which is uh, another derivative of Linux um, from uh, from uh, 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 Apple. Um, this is based off of BSD. There you go. Uh, it's based off of Darwin BSD. Did I say Linux? Sorry about that. Yeah, this is based off the uh, the BSD. Now, if you read when we get into licensing, if you read the difference between a, a, a GPL license, which Linux is under, and uh, the BSD license, which Darwin BSD is under, uh, what you'll find out is that the, the major difference is that um, you can actually take a BSD product and take it proprietary. In other words, pull it back in, change it, and not release anything. So Apple has chosen to go down that route. So this is a lot like Linux, a lot like Unix. Um, by the way, I, pre I preceded Linux uh, in my in my career so um, it took me a long time to get to calling things Linux and I don't always do it right um, but this is just another Unix extension so if we look here I cloned my thing into open source modules introduction I, well, I, I cloned the git repository into spring 2022 CSCI 4470 open source um, and now I am down in uh, modules 01 introduction, and I'm in, actually in the Linux block right now. Um, and if you see, this is um, this is what you, it'll look like when you first get there. So there's a, uh, a make file and a source. Um, if you go make dash dash help, is that it? Yeah. Um, So what you need is you need some build file, build system, make, gmake will also work, um, that takes a make file as a spec, right, and the make file is included, right, so we can look at, this is what the make file looks like, right, so these are the different things that you can, the different things that you can make, okay, I've been making slides. 
And I will post these, by the way, um, like I said. But there's the slides. Um, and the source is down there. Most of it's in this index.rst file. There are some, a few uh, illustrations and things down in the static and, uh, and the CSS. And then there's this comp file that kind of defines things like the year, author, etc. Okay? So anyway, this is, this is how you're set up. And then you just have to do, you have to have Sphinx installed. Right? Sphinx. And there are some other tools like... Uh, there are other, some other Sphinx tools that Python will complain about if you don't have them. It's just a matter of getting them installed. And you need a Python... I think 3.8 will work, but I am currently on Python 3.9, okay? So if you have all those, you just do make and then what you want to make. Like uh, slides, make, PDF, LaTeX. Um, for this thing, I, was, I made slides. Right? And then it'll just go and do a Sphinx build. Um, and... Unless I did something wrong, this in a few minutes should actually create the build. And now we can look. It's created a build directory. And if we look under build, doc trees, which is an auxiliary directory in slides. And then if we uh, do ls slides. Right, there's the files. Um, and that pops the... Uh, There, that pops the slides up. All right, so that's really all there is to it. And, and most of the stuff will be organized uh, similarly to that. If you have Linux installed, if you have a Linux installed, this should be pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're trying to do it under Windows, um, it's a little more complicated in that you have to get, uh, you know, either have to be working under something like WSL2 uh, or you need to get um, a latex compiler or Actually, for this one, yeah, probably a LaTeX compiler. Uh, I use MicTech and uh, and Sphinx installed, um, so it's not it's not really all that difficult. All right, Does that answer your question. And we'll help you out with that either during lab or uh, or in office hours or anything. All right. That's yep. All right, guys, um, we're about five minutes over, or two minutes over. Oh, that's not so bad. My clock's a little fast. Um, so we will, uh, we will see you on Friday with your first lab. Um, and uh, a lot of reading this time. We'll probably have a, a, you know, starting next time, we'll start having more hands-on kind of uh, stuff and, and hopefully less reading.
Hello. Hi. What's up? Yeah, you wanted to meet to dis. You wanted to meet after to discuss the requirements. Yeah. Or expectations rather. So, what, what's your uh, what's your uh, background, Alex? So I'm ITWS. Okay. So you know, um, and and I think we have what algorithms or something is required. What, what was it? PSoft. PSoft. Um, so the only thing we, we like to make sure is that um, you're comfortable in, in kind of an environment where. Um, you, can you see my 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 screen now? No. <laughs> I did work at Cisco in WebEx support, so if you have any questions about that. Yeah, no, I just don't know what's... My main question is why this thing isn't working. I, I've been using the same setup for two years now, and it is no longer working. So there's two of you in the meeting. Do you have the yeah. correct one set to be the on stage? Yeah, I even killed the other... You should be able to see both of them, quite honestly. Um, no, it's locked to only one right now. I don't know. I, it's just I've been using the same setting for. I'm going to get out of my other one. Let's see if that. I've been using that other one as a monitor so that I can see what you guys see. And. Uh, And you're still not seeing it. Nope. Because it's showing it for me. All right. Um, yeah. So, you know, the only thing we want to make sure is that you that you feel comfortable. Um, you know, what you have to. I'll, I'll stop screwing with this and, and start talking to you. Um, you know. The reason we we do this is just to make sure that you guys feel comfortable. There's, you know, you, you'll be installing and uh, and using a lot of different software. And, uh, you know, we do everything from getting Docker to run to, uh, you know, TensorFlow and uh, and MongoDB, you know, or at least some database. Uh, maybe not Mongo if I can get away from it. Um, but uh, and and it's just to make sure that you that you feel comfortable in that. Um, so you said you worked at Cisco? Yeah, I did. I've also, I use Docker regularly. Okay. I've used right, MongoDB, so. All right. Um, yeah. Why don't you uh, at least join the waiting room? And uh, there's one more person I have to talk to, and once I've talked to them, I'll, I'll, I'll pull you in from the waiting room. Okay. Yeah. I think, so the new way to override that is you can go in. We don't have to do like the authorization form anymore. Yeah, and I've been having problems with that, quite honestly. Um, I, I'm willing to try it with you right now if you want to try it. Um, sure. I've been, you know, because I know that I can I can ra raise the uh, enrollment from uh, from uh, what is that batch? Or you can set that. That has to be set through the registrar, I believe. But yeah, I can, I can uh, ask them to change it. Um, let me get on the system. The problem is it's not, I'm having, I, I'm, unless you've, have you done this before? You've been walked through? Joining uh, the new override system? Yeah. I did it with the, so I'm doing co-term, so that was a whole mess getting into 6,000 level class. But yeah, that was because I wasn't graduate yet. Okay, so I'm trying to let you in. What's your your ID? Uh, hold on one second. I have to join my. Okay, my ID six six one seven five five. I'm 
sorry, 661. 755. Okay. 114. Okay. Okay, so I overrode you for closed courses and uh, prerequisites. So see if you can sign in. She'd override you for the other one, too. That work or looks? Yeah, I think it did. All right. I haven't been, I've been having all sorts of problems getting people through that. Yeah, I couldn't, I was going to go to check the box on the course list. That's how I've been doing it, but it, since it was full, I couldn't do that. So if I put in uh, the CRM annually, then it worked. Okay. okay. All right. Well, good. I wasn't very hopeful because I've been trying to let people in off the wait list. And the only way I ended up doing it was actually getting them to raise the raise the cap. I've been giving everybody these per, these permissions, and it just I don't know. Maybe they have to exit the wait list or something first. I don't know. It's ridiculous. All right. <laughs> Anything else, Alex? Uh, I think that's, that's it. it. All right. Sounds good. I, I like my back. Oh, you can't see my back my background. This this is <laughs> a, annoying as heck. It was between this class and computer vision, so. Oh, compu you know, computer vision is good as well. I uh, I took that, well, I, it was robot vision when I took it. I'm not sure whether it still is or not. But, uh, yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll see you on Friday then. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.